All right, everybody, let's get started by reviewing. Let's get started by reviewing the problem of the day. So the problem of the day, as you might have noticed, was pretty uh, lengthy. It required you to know a lot of the proton transfer steps and the mechanisms that we've been covering. Specifically, we ended last Thursday talking about nitrogen nucleophiles, and in this case, you're using hydrazine. So the first step in this reaction would be to protonate your carbonyl. In this case, it's an aldehyde. I know the book shows this a little bit differently than I do. You're welcome to show it either way. But usually the first step is protonation. Then the next step, we're going to add in hydrazine, which is a good nucleophile. So let me actually show all my arrows. And the hydrazine will add in to our good electrophile and kick up electrons onto oxygen. And I'm going to show deprotonation with our conjugate base. You can show it with an amine. Um, it doesn't really matter. You just need to show the correct proton transfer steps. So we need to deprotonate it, our nitrogen. And we're almost there. What's our next step? Yep, we recreate our acid. And what will it protonate? The alcohol. So in this step, we protonate our alcohol. We can turn it into a very good leaving group. And then we can shove that alcohol off using the lone pair from nitrogen. And we end up with this kind of strange looking compound. Does anybody remember the name of this? Yep, it's a hydrozone. I guess we need to do one last deprotonation before we get to the hydrozone. So a hydrozone is a specific type of imine. So in this case, I'll just show our conjugate base grabbing that proton. Now what can we do? Now the nitrogen can attack the carbon. I normally show this with protonation first. Eddie and I were talking about it in my office. The book actually shows it both ways, um, so it's fine as long as you have protonation either at the beginning or after this step. You can have it both ways. <laughs> Eddie's pretty proud. The book actually has a comment saying that recent research has shown that nucleophilic attack can occur before protonation. But the reactions are so rapid and almost uh, synchronous that it doesn't even really matter. You're just getting into semantic arguments at that point. You should try to always show double arrows. All right, so now we've got an alcohol. He's going to go up and change it. All right, so now we've got an alcohol. We can protonate that alcohol. Again, we're turning the alcohol into a very good leaving group. Oh, 
Oops, I actually missed a step here. We didn't deprotonate. Sorry. Yeah, I would have lost a point on that. So now we've got our neutral molecule. Because we always want neutral molecules, right? Yep. Molecules are incredibly unstable if they have multiple charges on them, at least in most cases. Hmm? All right, now what do we do? Hey guys, you gotta leave your problem day up here. He brought it to us. <laughs> we kick off the water. And we're almost there. Then comes my favorite part of this mechanism. How do we get to a midazole? Why the carbon and not the nitrogen? Because it's a, this is not aromatic, but in this step we can grab a proton off of this end. And the driving feature in this reaction is the aromatic stabilization that occurs in the imidazole. And this is because the lone pair on this top of nitrogen is delocalized through the uh, pi system. The lone pair on this nitrogen is in an sp2 orbital and cannot delocalize. So we do have six pi electrons. The precursor, on the other hand, has an sp3 carbon and is not aromatic. So this is very, very thermodynamically favorable. Yep? The oxygen still a hydrogen from the positive nitro, whatever it is. So if you tried to deprotonate the hydrogen on the nitrogen in the previous step, you'd still be stuck at a non-aromatic precursor. Oh, I mean, it's like way back towards, like you deprotonate the nitrogen, but instead of using the conjugate base to do that, would you use the alcohol to do that? Yep, you could uh, show that as well. So you could have water do these proton transfers. The key is that you do have to show proton transfers as alcohol, individual steps. Alcohol. Yeah, you could have the alcohol. Or you mean? On, on the ring, the alcohol do Yeah, I mean, you can have a, an int intramolecular proton transfer, but usually it's done by separate molecules because that's very strange to reach over and grab. Yep. All right, so that one was a pretty tough problem, I thought. I wanted to get you guys used to drawing the full mechanisms for a lot of these. Yep. So, um, I know you said all these are equilibrium, but what are there any equilibrium that you have equilibrium? Yeah, that's a great question. So you, did you notice how my last arrow is a single-headed arrow? Yeah, how do you even know that? So I was trying to describe this to somebody earlier today, and I said the best way to think of this is by using an energy landscape. So let's say this is the reaction progress. And then we've got energy on one axis. You have your first few, whoa, your first few steps that have these pretty small activation energies, and then you've got a really big thermodynamic sink. This entire portion is reversible. Well, reverse This is non-reversible. And that's because the uh, stabilization by making your ring aromatic drops. The energy level makes it very, very stable, and it has a hard time climbing out of that thermodynamic sink. The, the last step is a single-headed arrow, where you form your aromatic ring. Prior to that, it's all under equilibrium control. Yep. So that's when we discussed aromaticity, saying that um, aromatic rings are very, very stable. 
and it's very hard to pull something out of aromaticity. You have to provide a lot of energy. It wouldn't be considered uh, equilibrium conditions. We saw that during electrophilic aromatic substitution that you can break aromaticity, but it requires a huge amount of energy. All right, so let's continue on to where we ended on Thursday. And we were talking a lot about enamines and uh, imines. And I said in this set of practice problems, the key is to identify your original carbonyl and your amine. Um, we're going to practice this a little bit more today, too. But let's go down to the second reaction. It looks like we've got an enamine, and we've got to figure out where our amine portion is. But this gets a little bit more complicated. Does anybody have an idea of what it might look like? Exactly. What do, what do you think, Brian? Were you so thinking that? With an alpha chain that comes off of it that has some nitrogen at the end? Yeah, exactly. So if we look at this one, you can imagine breaking that bond, right? So let me change the color there. You can imagine breaking that bond and showing the precursor of this. So you can draw it like this, right? So it's a little smushed in there. Let me actually try to clean this up a bit. <laughs> the question is, why did it form an enamine rather than an imine? <coughs> because it's a secondary amine. If it were a primary amine, what would we get? An imine, right? So in these reactions, you should try to be able to break them apart. In this case, we've got a nitrogen attached to a carbon, and that carbon is now a part of an alkene system, so you can tell that this is an enamine, and you can try to sever that bond and show where the original amine came from. So we're going to continue on and try to show some of these hydrolysis reactions, which are essentially these reactions, but in the reverse order. And I should also include catalysts here just to be thorough. So let's continue on and talk about hydrolysis reactions. Usually that's the driving force of getting the reaction to go in the forward direction. Um, there's a few techniques. One of them I talked about was actually distilling off the water. Um, sometimes, too, there are these things called molecular sieves that are these beads that are highly um, functionalized so that they absorb water but no other compounds. And so sometimes you see reactions where they say MS, um, and that is symbolic for molecular sieves, and that's something used to absorb water out of a reaction. All right, so let's think about hydrolysis reactions. That's the reverse order. In any of these reactions, whether or not you're going in the forward direction or backwards, you always start with a proton transfer. Always. Yep. Always. And then you go through this set of intermediates where you do nucleophilic addition and or um, loss of leaving groups. And then you end with a proton transfer. It doesn't matter if you're going in the forward direction or the reverse direction. You always have to show all of your proton transfers and all of those attacks. So let's just think about um, an example reaction. And in this case, I'm going to use a pretty simple one. I think we may have even shown the mechanism for this, but I want to show it going both directions. <coughs> so what sort of functional group will this give? 
and acetal, specifically a cyclic acetal, which are used as protecting groups. And then we would also form water. But let's look at the forward mechanism. Just to review it, I'll go through it pretty quick, but feel free to stop me if um, you want me to explain one of the steps. Again, first step is going to be our protonation or our proton transfer from our acid to our base. The next step will be reaction with our diol, and we would call this a nucleophilic attack. Let me include all my arrows here. So we already had our nucleophilic attack. Then we have a set of proton transfers. where our conjugate base will come and deprotonate our new ether. And what's this functional group called? Hemiacetal. And then in the next step, we can show protonation of our water. We kick off our functional group, or sorry, we turn our alcohol into a good functional group that we can kick off. Let me slide this over. So we can shove off our water. So you're saying in this step, why did it protonate this alcohol instead of this one? Yeah. In reality, there will be an equilibrium of both. But this one, if we protonate it, we can kick it off. This one, we can't kick off. So it would be in a constant equilibrium. There wouldn't be much of it protonated, and it wouldn't get you anywhere. That's a good question. OK, and then we can have another nucleophilic attack pick up our electrons. And then last but not least, we can end with the deprotonation. So the, the mechanism is exactly what we've seen before. Yep? There are some situations where it will stop at the hemiacetal, like in the case of glucose, it can't go to the acetal. Oftentimes, um, if you're forming a cyclic ring system when you make your hemiacetal, it'll get trapped in that ring system. Um, but those aren't as common. Normally, when we form a hemiacetal, we're adding on some long chain, and then it will want to wrap up even further. Yep. All right, so if we think about the acid-catalyzed hydration, we can essentially draw all of these backwards. So let me actually change this a little bit, and I'm going to abbreviate this and say... These arrows are shown in red. Oh. And then we'll do the reverse mechanism in blue. Because some people get really psyched out when they see the hydrolysis reaction, but all it is is the same reaction just backwards. 
So now let's add in blue arrows and try to work from our final product, which is the cyclic acetal, all the way back to our ketone. So the first step in this case would be protonation, right? And then in the next step, we can say, well, let's kick open our alcohol. And then in the next step, we also have to include our water. So let's actually draw that in. We can say, well, water can add in. And then in the next step, we can say, all right, this can actually come grab a proton. I'm not going to show the bond in there, but you get the idea that our conjugate base can deprotonate that alcohol. And then in the next step, we can show this alcohol getting protonated. I know this gets pretty messy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bad. And then if we go for um, our next one. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. I don't even know where I'm at now. <laughs> How long are there So when I do these, I try to always stick with the exact same mechanism and then try doing it forward and backwards. So you may want to actually draw a couple of these as practice. Okay. Will you ever ask us to do that, though? I could ask you to show a hydrolysis reaction for one of these. But the key is knowing if you, if you can do the forward reaction, you should be able to do the reverse, right? I would ask you to do one or the other, not both. Yeah. And then in the last one, we just have our conjugate base kicking off there. So really, the only reason I wanted to emphasize this was people really psych themselves out. And they think that it's a completely new reaction that they have to learn when it's not. It's just the reverse reaction that they have to remember. Just reversed. The other thing to, yeah? So, the problem is the problem there when you have all these grades, these are the reasons, there's always that one last step that's going to try to answer the other stuff. So you can only have the reversible reaction, meaning going in the backwards direction, if you're not stuck in a thermodynamic sink. And the problem of the day that we just had, we had an additional step that got us stuck in a thermodynamic sink, and it would be very challenging to get back out of that. Um, but in these situations, cyclic acetals are used as a protecting group, if you remember. So we very much want to remove these at the end of a reaction. And we have to be able to show these in both the forward and reverse direction. There's one cool trick you can use. And I know a lot of people were struggling with this on the sapling assignments. And that is to identify your carbon with nucleophiles attached. <laughs> so let's take an example of an acetal. And then we've got our imine. And then we've got our enamine. All of these can be hydrolyzed. Yeah. 
what conditions would we need to use in order to get back to our parent ketone? We need acid because we need to do that initial protonation. But if we want to use Le Chatelier's principle and drive the reaction in the reverse direction, what can we add? Water. So instead of removing water from the reaction, we can purposely treat it with strong acid and water in each of these situations. So I just put a drop of sulfuric acid in followed by a bunch of water. But like I was saying, the key is to identify the carbon with the nucleophiles attached, which in this case would be right there, which means the circled green area had to come from the original ketone, right? Same thing here. That's our carbon with our nucleophile attached, which means again, this is the area that was from the parent ketone. And then if we go to our enamine, the carbon still has that nitrogen in it attached, so that's the group that originally came from the ketone. And if we come back here, we can say, all right, that carbon initially had a CO bond. So you shouldn't get too freaked out when you see these. You you just use this simple trick of looking at where the nucleophiles attach, mark that, and then break it apart and try to figure out where your original ketone or aldehyde came from. Does that make sense? Conversely, you could say the other groups were your nucleophiles, and you can figure out what amine or alcohol you would need to go in the reverse direction, right? So a lot of your sapling problems have these in there. Um, if you get stuck on them, you're more than welcome to come talk to me. But see if you can actually work through the full mechanism, too. It's really good practice to show all of the arrow pushing. All right. Is it okay if we move on, or do you guys want to see another example? Which one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a C double bond. Let me draw that. All right, so let's continue on to sulfur nucleophiles, and then we'll end with some easy stuff. <laughs> sulfur nucleophiles are very, very straightforward. In fact, so straightforward, I'm not even going to show the mechanism because it's the exact same as what we've seen with oxygen nucleophiles. So instead of using an alcohol, we're going to use a thiol. And if we do this, instead of getting an acetal, we get the sulfur analog. And what do you guys think the sulfur analog to an acetal would be called? Thioacetal. Thio <laughs> Pretty easy to remember. It's the exact same mechanism as normal acetal formation. We just swap out the oxygens with the sulfur. Very easy to do. You don't normally see thioacetals that often. They're not synthetically that useful. But the cyclic derivative is very, very useful. And this is just simply called a cyclic thioacetal. And it's not used as a protecting group. It's actually very, very stinky to do this reaction. Anytime you run a reaction with thiols on it, it smells like rotting eggs, oftentimes even worse than rotting eggs. But what it is used for um, is a type of reduction You found a real <laughs> It was the most nastiest thing I ever in my life. I, I'm actually going to give you guys a problem soon about thousand year old eggs. Has anybody had those? No. 
You can buy them in Chinese stores because they pickle these eggs and they turn black. And we're going to talk about that when we get into our Amid chapter, but sometimes they'll smell pretty funky too. All right. All right, the cool thing with this cyclic bioacetal is you can treat it with this thing called rainy nickel. And when you add rainy nickel to a cyclic thioacetal, you can actually reduce the carbon. And so in a way, this is really, really similar to the Wolf-Kishner reduction, right? Where we can take a ketone or an aldehyde, and we can just cleave that CO double bond. And the nice thing about this is that it avoids base. Whoop, shoot. What does that even look like? Sure? We'll, we'll talk about it. So they avoid using a base? Yeah, because if you remember, the Wolf-Kishner reduction used uh, potassium hydroxide and heat. If you've got a base-sensitive molecule, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. But with this one, you don't have any strong base around. And we said we have to use strong base with the Wolf-Kishner re reaction. And so if you're making a really complex natural product, for example, where you've got really sensitive functional groups, sensitive to base, this is an excellent alternative to that. And rainy nickel is kind of strange. It's actually not pure nickel. It's actually a nickel aluminum alloy. Specifically, it's a spongy. Nickel, aluminum, alloy with hydrogen absorbed. And so it's really nice to do this reaction um, because not only do you avoid strong base, but you're using really, really cheap metals. Using nickel and aluminum, they're very abundant metals. It's much, much uh, easier to get your hand on a large amount of nickel and aluminum compared to something like platinum, which is a precious metal. So if you work in a large industry, this uh, method is um, a very preferred way of um, trying to reduce groups off. It is similar to what the Wolf-Kishner re reduction. That's another alternative to it if you do have a molecule that can withstand strong bases. What's the other reaction where we can cleave off a CO double bond? Yeah, Clemenson reduction. So in a way, it's similar to all of these. Yes, it's a very, very porous metal, and so you can actually absorb a fair amount of hydrogen onto it. But each of these has limitation, specifically the Wolf-Kishner reduction requires strong base. Nope. And the Clemenson reduction, occasionally you'll see it with alkyl ketones and aldehydes, but it's almost always done with aryl ketones. Limited to aryl ketones or aldehydes. Using rainy nickel, we can um, get around a lot of the limitations to the uh, other reduction conditions that we've already learned. But like I said, the nice thing is you don't need to know the mechanism for this. It involves a lot of uh, organometallic chemistry that's outside of the scope of this course.
In fact, I don't even think your book has the mechanism in there because it is um, a pretty complex mechanism. All right, are there any questions with the sulfur nucleophiles? It's just another synthetic tool that we have. Usually it's added on if you want to reduce uh, a carbonyl group. All right, now we get to go into some review. Because I know some people, they learn something one quarter and then it's just straight out yeah. the next quarter. So hydrogen nucleophiles. We can re reduce an aldehyde. We can reduce a ketone. We can reduce an ester. Or we can reduce a carboxylic acid. All right, so if we want to reduce an aldehyde, what reagents do we need? Yeah, NABH4. And we normally run this in an alcohol solvent. And if you do this reaction, you can get your primary alcohol. Can you use lithium aluminum hydride? Yes. Yeah. Lithium aluminum hydride will also work, so I'll put an asterisk. Oh, yeah, that's the big boy one, right? Yep. Hey, I have to name things that will bring about whatever works, right? Oh, man, I'm having trouble writing. LAH will work. So the, the tricky thing is, or I guess not tricky, the useful thing is you can selectively reduce a ketone and aldehyde while leaving esters and carboxylic acids intact. So if you are looking to create a product that has an ester or a carboxylic acid, you can avoid touching those by using sodium borohydride. If we do the next one, again, we can use sodium borohydride or LAH. But this time, instead of getting your primary alcohol, you end up getting a secondary alcohol. And then what about these last ones? LAH. Specifically with an ester, you can do LAH in excess and get all the way to your primary alcohol. And then you normally treat this with water in the second step in order to protonate your alcohol. So this has to be a two-step reaction. And then same with your carboxylic acids. We're going to cover the mechanism for LAH reduction of carboxylic acids in particular next chapter. So we're going to leave that. Um, if you are a little rusty on this, I would recommend going through and looking at the mechanism um, from the previous chapters. Um, I'll give you guys a really quick mechanism. If you've got a ketone, and let's just use LAH as our example. There we go. College is hard. So in the first step, the hydride gets transferred up to the oxid or to the electrophile. And then in the next step, we've got a quick protonation. Wait a minute. I think I do kind of remember this. Yep, it's a pretty easy reaction to remember mechanistically. The one thing that's very unique about this that we didn't really touch upon is the importance of the lithium. This reaction won't work without lithium. Lithium will actually coordinate to the oxygen on the carbonyl, and we'll talk a little bit more about that mechanism later. 
So the lithium acts as a Lewis acid activator in this reaction. If you take this and you throw in 12 crown 4, that crown ether that likes lithium, the reaction won't work. So it's not hydride itself doing the reaction. It's actually the combination of a hydride source and lithium that allows the reaction to occur. Um, so it's, it's the dual reaction. This is a very simplistic view of the reaction. We'll cover it in more detail when we cover uh, reduction of carboxylic acids. All right, so all of that should be review. Let's jump into carbon nucleophiles, which is also a review. The first one is obviously the Grignard reaction. This should be one that you're very familiar with at this point. And I'm going to draw this with a blue R. We can have a Grignard add into a ketone and then in the next step get protonated. And we can go straight to the alcohol. It depends whether or not you're using an aldehyde or a ketone. If you're using a ketone, you form your tertiary alcohol. If it's an aldehyde, you get to your secondary. That should all be review. If you are a little lost, you should go back to section 13.6. But I'm not going to spend any more time on the Grignard reaction because I feel like we've more or less mastered <coughs> that material. The new reaction that we haven't seen is a cyanohydrin reaction. Cyanohydrin formation. This reaction is not my favorite reaction to teach because um, most people are scared of it. Really? And you'll see why. You use potassium cyanide and then cyanide. So you have to either be very brave or have a death wish to really enjoy doing this reaction. And when you do this, that cyanide ion can act as a nucleophile and it can add into your electrophile. And this is called a cyanohydrin. And because this is so dangerous, oftentimes people replace cyanide, which will kill you, with a more friendly acid, like HCl or sulfuric acid, something that if you drip, spill it in the room, won't kill everybody, you know? Keep your lab mates happy. Nope. Apparently, it, it smells like uh, almonds. So if you're starting to smell almonds in a lab, it's a good time to leave. <laughs> um, but the yeah, there are some other things that smell like almonds too. The interesting thing with cyanide is it's actually present in a lot of uh, like peach pits and apricot pits. It's just not uh, present in a large quantity. I think I've heard something like that. And this is a very useful intermediate. Uh, cyanide. A very, very, very small amount. If you spend all day eating apple seeds, you'd eventually die from it. But you could say that about eating a lot of things. What's the purpose of it? Why? It's just a, a byproduct uh, from the biometabolism of apples. Okay. 
And so I'll quickly show you the derivatives that can be made from cyanohydrins. You can either reduce it using LAH followed by water or you can oxidize it by using acid and heat and if you reduce it you can actually go to an amine and if you oxidize it you can actually go to a carboxylic acid. So you can convert this functional group depending on the reducing or oxidizing conditions that you use and we're actually going to spend a fair amount of time talking about these reactions in chapter 21 so we're going to um, leave the mechanism until then. Whoops. All right, and that's where we're going to leave it today. Are there any other questions? If you can switch out cyanide for a hydrochloric acid, why would you ever use cyanide? Oftentimes because you don't want um, more of a mixture to clean up at the end. So if you use uh, cyanide, the conjugate base is the cyanide ion, which you're already adding in anyway. So it makes for a cleaner reaction. So if you're doing a large-scale reaction, yeah.